desires. So, having said that, uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless our time in his word. Father, thank you for this morning, and, and as always, Lord, thank you for worship. Uh, what an incredible gift uh, you have given us, people with the ability to to take song and to put music to it with words that really come, Lord, not just from our minds, but from our hearts. And Lord, I, I, I pray that that's, that's what worship is about. It's not about, you know, a band playing. It's about coming to you, coming before the throne, uh, recognizing who you are, Lord, what you've done, and then, Lord, waiting in anticipation for what you've yet to do. And what you've yet to do, Lord, is what we're going to be talking about here in our study this morning. And so I just pray that once again that you would give us eyes that see, Lord, ears that hear what it is that you want to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to continue on now. Uh, as always, I would assume I asked Travis if he was going to continue while I'm gone in Revelation, but he doesn't really want to do that. So so, uh, so we'll be, after today we'll be breaking a little bit, but we we find ourselves in a portion of, of the book of Revelation, which has really become my favorite. Well, well that's hard to say. One of my favorites uh, in the book of Revelation, because we're, we're going to begin chapter 10. Now, I have to tell you from, from you know, a mul multitude of years of studying these things, and I know I've said this in the past, uh, it never ceases to amaze me. You, you put all this time in each time you go into the Word, and then all of a sudden you go into it again, sort of to, to renew your mind, to renew your thinking. And, there's a, and God just gives you a whole new perspective. It's not a different perspective, it's new. And uh, it's great. I'm going to be changing this thing because this thing drives me insane. Well, that's better. I feel like there's a bug. I keep wanting to swat it. That's, this is what it was like when you taught in, in Belize. There was always something flying by your face, and so you're always swatting at things. Anyway... But uh, this chapter 10, there's a, there's a big transition that's coming here. And, and, you know, I have taught it in the past and looked at it from a, a really a, a different perspective than we're going to look at it this morning. Um, with all of the other things that we've been talking about, I think this chapter has, is really a pivot point in the study of the book of Revelation. And you're, you're going to understand why once we get into that. But we have this incredible picture now or this vision that John sees. And by the way, his perspective has changed. Remember we said when we began our study, one of the keys to understanding Revelation is to recognize where you are. Um, it's like watching a movie. Sometimes you're, you're seeing from, you know, this particular camera and there is this view. And then you switch to another camera and there's that view. And you have to understand that when you look at the book of Revelation. Because there are often times, and we have been for quite some time actually, um, John has been in heaven seeing events in heaven. And then he was seeing events in heaven as they pertain to how they react with the earth. But today we're going to see that there's a big change because he's clearly on the earth now and seeing something based on what he's describing here. And of course, this is the angel, the great mighty angel that comes out of heaven. But he's much more than an angel. And so we need to get an understanding of this because what's about to happen here really is transitioning because remember now, we are on a break between the, the blowing of the sixth trumpet. Actually, the sixth trumpet is blown, but the seventh trumpet is about to blow, and there's what we call this interlude, this pause that takes place, just like there was between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seal, the first set of judgments, remember? And, uh, and in there we saw two different aspects. Between that we saw the marking of the 144,000 Jews of, of, of actual descendants of Abraham. And then we saw a great multitude which couldn't be numbered. So you've got the mark to the multitude. And that was the two uh, visions, I guess, that were present there in that interlude between the sixth and seventh seal. When we come to the trumpets, it's the same thing. And there again will be two visions, and we're going to find the first of those here this morning. And the reason those are significant is because with each seventh of each of it, whether it's the seals, the trumpets, or the bowl judgments, which are yet to come, um, obviously the number seven is the number of completion, not the number of perfection, the number of completion. And so when we, when we understand that, this, this interlude is important because as you get to complete that particular set of judgments, whether it be seals, in our case, seals and now trumpets, the completion of that is going to be something that's really, really quite extraordinary. 
It's going to be devastating for those who have rejected the Lord. Um, but it's really interesting when you understand it from, from the, the, the scriptural perspective. So let's take some time. We're going to look through this. Um, and I know I had said uh, uh, a few weeks back that I had wanted to change and sort of read the entire passage and then come back. But uh, that's not going to work, especially the way that I teach, because uh, it, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't lend itself to that because we're, we break things down so much. So I apologize for that if any of you were wondering why I have uh, not been following that. So in chapter 10 now, um, and we saw at the end of the sixth trumpet this, this horrible, horrible judgment that comes on mankind, and yet it has no effect on him. Remember, those were the last words that we talked about last week, that that in spite of all of this, mankind still did not repent. He did not turn away from the things which he was doing. And the things which he was doing was, was uh, sorceries, was his adulteries, was his immoralities, was it all of the things that man has, his murders, his stealing, all of those things that in spite of the fact that it is clear that God is now judging mankind, mankind still stands with his fists stuck in God's face. Now that's important for us to keep in mind. We're going to see that again. That as severe as these things get, that man always thinks that he's bigger than what he is. And he always thinks he's in control, right? The same, in your, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're the captain of our own ship. And as I have said in the past, you ain't captain of diddly squat. It don't matter what you think. None of us knows what's going to happen five minutes from now. And so how can you possibly be in control of anything? So what a dumb thing to say. But it's, it is. So you're not a captain of your soul, just in case you didn't know that. But so mankind, regardless of what God does and how God reveals his plan, mankind will always resist who he is. It's just the nature, as they say, of the beast of that part of us that rebelled so long ago and still happens to be in us. And even as believers, we, resi- we, we, we have a tendency to resist God, don't we? We will we, we'll resist Him and live our lives basically the way we choose to live them, knowing full well that these things aren't pleasing. We'll do them anyways. So we can't just look at the world and say, well, how could they? Well, when we do the same thing. Anytime you start thinking about somebody else, whether they're a believer, a brother and a sister, or, or they're not, and you start wanting to point a finger... The remedy for that is to go spend about five minutes looking in a mirror. That'll stop you that real fast. Because none of us, none of us, even with God's spirit within us, have any right to point a finger at anyone else. Period. End of story. So, having said that and understanding now what's going on, John now records for us these words. In chapter 10, starting in verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. In other words, in response to what this particular angel said. Now, there is no end to debate over whether this is actually an angel or whether it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it doesn't, the the books as far back as you want to go, there is an argument over this. And the argument typically for the fact that this is an angel in this particular perspective, probably Michael, because we know that Michael is the prince of Israel. In other words, he's the protector of the nation of Israel. That's what Michael does. That's why I said, don't mess with Michael. You don't want to dink around with him, okay? Gabriel is the messenger of Messiah. Every time we see Gabriel in the scripture, he's talking about Jesus. But Michael, he's always protecting, he's always guarding, he's always fighting for the nation of Israel. We're going to see that again later on in the book of Revelation. So Michael is no one to be toyed with. Lucifer himself is going to get into a tough with Michael, and he's going to get whooped. So that tells you how bad Michael is. Don't mess with Michael. So they say this is Michael, and they say it can't be the Lord because nowhere else is the Lord called an angel. Now, is that correct? No, it is not correct. We know that Jesus shows up even in the Old Testament before he even came to this earth, and what is the title? The angel of the Lord, Malach. That's the Hebrew. He is the Malach of Elohim. 
of actually of Yah. So, so clearly, Jesus is referred to that. The problem is that most people, when you see this, the minute you see that English word angel, you're thinking, I don't know, angel. But what did we say the word angelos means? Messenger. So if we read it, I saw a mighty or another mighty messenger coming down from heaven. All of a sudden, it's a little easier to see that it's a different side. Now, I got to share this with you because this was really interesting to me, what, what God did with me this week. I was studying this stuff all week, and I was in the office last night. I'm usually up here till about 10 o'clock on Saturday nights. And, uh, and I was studying this, and I just kept reading this, and I was looking back at Daniel because we're going to see this all interweaves with the book of Daniel um, and a couple other places as well, but we're going to be talking about that here in a few minutes. And I was bound and determined because this is the way I had taught it before, and, and most of the guys that I was reading their stuff on were saying, this is Michael the archangel. And so I was all, so I literally had the PowerPoint presentation set up with this being Michael. I did last night till about 10 o'clock. When I left the office and locked up and got in the car and was thinking about this, that's why I studied. I like to do that late on Saturday nights. So when I go to bed, it's like ingrained in my brain. Um, and so, but as I got into the truck and I was driving home and I was thinking about all of this, I just thought, this isn't Michael. It's just not. The description cannot be Michael. Because the other argument is, okay, if you want to argue that nowhere is Jesus called an angel, you certainly can argue the opposite, which is there is never, ever a place in the scripture where an angel is described as having a rainbow, as specifically as a crown, clothed in the clouds with feet like pillars of fire. And when he speaks, it sounds like a lion. That only describes one individual. And we already know who that is. We saw him back in chapter one. And then we saw him again in chapter four. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Michael, because what's clearly being described here is something, someone who comes down. No, notice this. I saw another mighty messenger coming down from heaven. This is why I say now John's view is per change. He's now on earth. He's seeing earth. He's seeing something come down from heaven. So obviously he's in a different place now. And of course, when you're God, you can move people around like that because you're God. So, so he's now seeing it from the earth. So as he sees this angel coming down, notice the first thing that he sees. He was clothed with a cloud. Now you and I think of clouds and when, as you know, the little puffy things out there. And of course, we can all see whatever it is we want to see in those clouds, right? I mean, we all see little, little you know, cute little animals in the clouds and, and we see waves and it looks like there's a surfer on the wave. And I've even had it brought to my attention. There was an eagle there, which was the apostle John. I mean, it just goes on and on. So, so, but that's not, when the scripture is talking about clouds, it's not talking about clouds, okay, as we understand them. When a cloud is described in the scripture, I mean, now, there are times when it does describe actual clouds, but high, like 80, 98% of the time, it's talking about the glory of God, the Shekinah. So it's not a cloud as you and I understand that. Remember when Jesus said, behold, I'm coming on the clouds? And what have we always seen? We've seen pictures painted, and there's Jesus standing on the clouds. You know, he's that surfer that everybody thought they saw. <laughs> he's standing on the clouds, and everybody's looking at the clouds, thinking that that's what he's describing. He is not describing clouds. He is describing his glory, the Shekinah. Now, for those of you in our Wednesday night study in Exodus, you know and you understand this very clearly. Because the way that God chose to appear to his people, where they, they could visibly see him in the days of the Exodus, was none other than a cloud. It's called the Shekinah. It's the glory of God. So it isn't a cloud as you and under, I understand cloud. That's just moisture being collected in the atmosphere. So clearly, this is something that's beyond. So this cannot be an angel because it's describing the Shekinah glory. That's the first indication. Whoever this messenger is, he's obviously mighty. And by the way, it's only used two times in Revelation here. And we're going to see later on in chapter 18 that it's used of the, of 
probably the same angel. Well, not probably. I'm sure that it is. And guess what that angel does? He hurls a stone to the earth. Now, who does that sound like? Remember Daniel? I saw a stone cut out and it was thrown at the feet of the statue. Yeah, we're going to tie all this together. So the only two times mighty angel is used in this are both describing not an angel in my opinion at all. They're describing the Lord Jesus Christ based on this, based on what's going to be happening after this. This is just his description. In a second, we're going to see what he's actually doing. So he's coming clothed with the Shekinah. And there's a rainbow, and a rainbow was on his head. Now we all know what the rainbow is. If we understand, again, in our Wednesday study, we really looked at this in Genesis chapter 6 with God destroying these, these whatever they were, the Nephilim. And we've talked about that and gone over that. As Trav said, if you want to listen to the recordings, you certainly can. Um, but the, uh, what we've understood is that the whole concept of the flood, Noah's flood, was not just because people were bad. People are bad today. We're not getting a flood. So something was going on there that was abnormal. And certainly it was. But now that that judgment was complete, we all know that God says, and remember, we think again of rain, but what God is saying is wrath. I'm not going to do this kind of wrath ever again. I'm never going to make the earth flood again. And my promise is, of course, the rainbow. So we tend to think and understand the rainbow in the sense of, of that it is God's promise. And it certainly is. But what's it a promise of? To not bring that type of wrath on the earth again. You see? So you got this concept because you have Noah and his family in the ark protected not out of the judgment like Enoch was, but protected through the judgment, right? They were in the boat in the judgment. And I'm sure it was a pretty rough ride. But anyways, that's where they were at. So you have mercy in the concept of the, of the rainbow and the covenant, but you also have grace. I'm, I'm sorry, judgment. You have judgment, then you have mercy all in one. And if we don't see that throughout the whole of the scripture, then I don't know what else we see. I mean, it's everywhere. There's always judgment, but judgment always, there's always that element of mercy because God does not want to punish He's just, so he has to punish. If he doesn't punish the wicked and, and condemn the sinner, then he is not just. He's not. The judge that lets the guilty go away is not a judge that works in justice. You can't let the guilty go. They have to pay the consequences. So God... Wrath is, a, is an expression of his justice. He has to punish sin. He has to. Otherwise, you get a mess. So he's clothed with the cloud. So we know the Shekinah. And he's got a rainbow and it's on his head. So notice it's, it's in the con con concept. I'll get it out here in a minute. Um, of, of this mercy and judgment. But it's in the idea. It's kind of looking like a rainbow. Now, if you're John a Jew. And if you're uh, anybody that would have seen this at this particular junction, only John is seeing this, obviously. He's the one that got to see the revelation. You would immediately recognize what these things are. And why we as Americans and the modern church and, and from, a, from, a, you know, from a European perspective, which of course we're all from, we always want to try to see this from our intellectual perspective without stopping and thinking what it actually means to those that would have heard these words and would have meant to John. Remember, a Jewish Jesus is speaking to a Jewish John. Hello. Maybe we should understand what the Jews think, what the Jews believe. You think maybe? So if we're going to understand these things, we need to say that. And this is clear to them. John is saying, the one that I saw, this messenger, this mighty messenger, was the Shekinah of God, and he was crowned with the promises of mercy and judgment of God. That's a pretty heavy individual. That cannot be describing an angel. It just can't. There's no angel qualified for this. Zero. Not Michael or Gabriel, and certainly not even the, the, the living creatures that are around the throne. They're the, the upper, they're even higher than Michael and Gabriel. And those guys are pretty high. The, the, the beings that are around God's throne, I mean, wow, it's, it's amazing to even try to grasp it. 
So he's clothed with the Shekinah. He's wearing the, the covenant of mercy and judgment on his head. And his face was like the sun. Hello. We saw that in chapter 1. There was, there's a radiance about him. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel sees the Ancient of Days. And what does his face do? It's radiating. Okay? His face was like the sun. And his feet like pillars of fire. Now this is really important because the pillars of fire are a picture. They're symbolic of the concept of judgment and purity. And only one that is absolutely pure can bring judgment. So his feet are like pillars of fire. Now keep that in mind. Now notice verse 2. And he had a little book open in his hand. Now I think we should remember this is the second of two books that we have seen in the scripture. We saw one in chapter 5 with the scroll that was sealed seven times. Remember the seals. And we went into all of that stuff. It's not a Roman document. It was a Jewish document. In fact, the Hebrew word there is sefer, which means book. Not a scroll. But our translators, for whatever reason, turned it into scroll. But notice here, they don't. Here it's literally a book. Now there is a big difference because the scroll earlier that no one could open except, yeah, him, Jesus, the lamb, who turns out to be like a lion. Wow, amazing. Well, that's exactly who he is. But that one was closed and only he could open it. Notice this one. This little book open in his hand. Now what did the first sealed book or book, what did it do? It revealed judgment, right? It led to the seals. It's led to all of the stuff where we've been. But now this book that's being brought into the picture after that, notice it's coming at the, after the sixth trumpet, but this one is not sealed any longer. It is open. So the judgments that are found within this book are about to be on display in what's to follow. It's open. We don't need to describe what it is. We're, 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 we're seeing it as it's happening. So this little book is open in his hand. Now remember the feet, the pillars of fire, judgment and purity. Actually, purity then judgment because you can't ultimately judge unless you're pure and only Christ qualifies for that. Now remember those feet, what does he do? He sets his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Can you imagine what this must have looked like to John? Here's this one clothed in the glory of God with the rainbow of judgment and mercy on his head. His face is glowing like, like the sunshine. His feet are like this. And all of a sudden, because clearly it wasn't happening before, he puts one foot boom, onto the land and one foot boom, onto the sea. Ownership, authority, the right to rule, to take back. That's what's being described here. No angel can do that. They just can't. So he's stepping one foot, a pillar of fire, onto the land and one onto the sea. Now where John is seeing this happening, obviously the whole world's going to see this. Well, how can that happen when Israel's a half a... He's God, folks. He can do that kind of thing. But it's clear that he's got a foot in the Mediterranean and a foot in the Middle East. And he's straddling, as it were, Jerusalem. How do we know? What happens next in the 11th chapter? We're not going to get there today. He's immediately going to tell them to measure the temple. Whoa. So this isn't just that he's taken back control of the earth, whether it be land or sea. He is taking absolute control and establishes his kingdom. And as a matter of fact, in the last half of the 11th chapter, we're going to see the seventh trumpet blown. And do you know what the seventh trumpet is? The kingdoms of man have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's taking back the world. This ain't happened yet. As any cursory understanding of what's happening in the world should tell you. He's not in control yet. But there will be a day when he plants one foot in the sea and one foot on the earth. 
Now again, later on, we'll be talking about this more then, so I don't want to belabor the point now. But remember, there are going to be those who oppose him, who've set themselves up to be him. We call him the Antichrist, right? And guess where they come from? And he's going to have a false prophet, a false spirit. He's a false son, and his Lucifer is the false god, false trinity. And guess where they come from? From the sea is where the dragon comes from, and from the land. So they're coming out of, when he actually shows himself, they're coming out of a representation of the world that already Jesus has taken back control of. And we're going to see that that's highly going to irritate him. So this is really significant. We have a tendency to break these things down and separate them. They're not broken down nor separate. They are all connected. Now the other side of this thing is that we know that C often represents, can represent multitudes, right? Now that can be represented sometimes in the Hebrew way of thinking. The angels, the heavenly host as we would call it, have, are reckoned to be likened like a C, okay? But man as the land. So there is this idea, secondary idea, that he is taking control of the supernatural realm as well as the physical realm. But it's clear he's putting them on the earth. Okay? And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Okay? So he's looking south. Interesting. But we'll get there later. And then he cries with a loud voice. Now, it's interesting to do a study on God's voice in the Scripture because what you often see is God's voice is equated with thunder. Now, it doesn't mean, again, like clouds. We always think clouds. Jesus coming on the clouds. Always going to be standing on a cloud. No, he's coming in glory. Okay? Uh, and so we, we have a, a tendency to think about voice and think about thunder like you and I understand thunder. Okay? But... That, they're just describing what it sounds like. It's the, the only thing that they could compare it to was thunder. Now, I've said this before, but if you've never been in a place like Belize, then you don't know what thunder is. I'm telling you. We've heard some pretty loud thunder here in, in Mesquite, uh, occasionally. In Belize, it's all the time. When we lived there, it was unbelievable how loud the thunder can be. It is, by the way, on the record as having the loudest thunder in the world because of the, she the reef that's there and because it's in the tropics, so it gets the rain. And I'm telling you, when it thunders there, you think you've heard thunder? You haven't heard thunder. You've heard a squeak. <laughs> when you literally hear thunder that rattles you to the core of your being, the house shakes, and it's like the whole world just collapsed in on top of you. It does that here even sometimes. But I'm telling you, it is beyond comprehension unless you experience it. And what was funny is a couple of the Belizeans, you would think they grew up there. But these guys, especially one Dewey, lived in town, he would tell me I was talking when we first got there, and I was like, holy cow, dude, this thunder here is just unbelievable. He goes, oh, yes. He goes, he goes, and I get so scared. This guy's like 35 years old. He goes, I get so scared when the thunder is. I just, I just curl up on my bed and put the blanket and the pillow over my head. I'm like, you've lived here your whole life. Nothing has happened to you. So what exactly are you afraid of? But it's the sound is so overwhelming. It's just incredible. And the weird thing about the thunder there is that it rolls you'll get this loud boom and then it's like when it just will go and just keeps going and going. It is incredible. But it pales in comparison to this voice. If you were going to liken God's voice to anything, if I was to hear God's voice like this, I would say it sounded like thunder in Belize. They're doing the best they can. But oftentimes God vo God's voice is recorded for us as speaking from thunder. So he spoke to the Israelites on the mountain. Remember, he called, the cloud came down. He called Moses to come up on the mountain and the mountain started thundering and the people were all, oh, let's go see God. Let's go see God. Let's go see God until 
the thundering started. And then the trump of God started to blow and it started to increase in its sound. And the people started going, uh, no. We don't want to go anywhere near that mountain. Here, Moses, you go for us. Yeah, we would have done the same thing. So clearly, this is not normal thunder. These are not normal clouds and lightning. It's not a normal trumpet that's blown in the temple. It's the trump of God, which is what Paul says is the one that's going to call at towards the end of the time. So, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Now, I mean, really, so what, what uh, you know, who else sounds like this? Nobody. Michael might have a very deep voice, but he ain't going to sound like no lion, man. That's one person. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He can open the scroll, so stop whining. Remember that? Chapter 5? Literally what's said there. The elder said to him, John, stop sniveling, man. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he's qualified to open the seals. Well, wait a minute. The last time I looked at him, he was a lamb. Yeah, that's because the lion and the lamb are the same person. So, so he cries with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. So there's a response to whatever it is he says. And it sounds like seven other voices. There were seven thunders. This is not new, as I said. We're going to start weaving now as we get into these portions. We're still going to get into Exodus and some other books of the Old Testament. But it's imperative, and I mean imperative, to understand what's going on in Revelation in light of Daniel. Or to understand Daniel in light of Revelation. Because you cannot separate them. Okay? So now here's Daniel chapter 7. And he's describing something that he's seeing here. Okay, this is, of course, um, uh, the, the, the passage where we get this ancient of days. So in other words, the eternal one. Okay, and this is what Daniel says. And this is as he, after he sees these visions of the beast. And I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. Hmm, where have we heard that before? And he came to the ancient of days. Ah, this is key for where we're going in Revelation. And they brought him near before him. Even though they're one and the same, the vision is that the Ancient of Days is, is overall. We're going to see that in just a few minutes. That's exactly what Jesus taught us. Okay? Verse 14. Then to him was given, that is the Son of Man, was given to him by the Ancient of Days. Then to him was given dominion and glory and the kingdom that all peoples nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. What Daniel is seeing here is the exact same thing that John sees in the book of Revelation. The, the, the comparisons are, are staggering. and We don't have time to really break it down but believe me, it's like they're seeing the same thing. By the way, there was another guy named Ezekiel that saw very similar stuff, and his description of it is the same. So why is the description different? The same as if you and some other person saw the same event. You would describe it in two different ways. No, we wouldn't. Yes, you stinking would. <laughs> yes, you would. Because you will have noticed something about whatever the event was that the other person didn't see. And vice versa. No two people are going to describe the same thing exactly. You might as well just get used to it. If you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Anyways, now in verse 10, I mean, sorry, verse 4, back to our study, now back to Revelation. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, now whatever, they, whatever these voices were saying, John understood them, okay? He knew precisely what they were saying. How do we know? Well, because I was about to write. I was about to write down what they said. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders have spoken and do not write them. Now this kills us, especially as Americans. 
well, we need to know what those seven thunders said. No, you don't. And it doesn't matter whether you want to or not. You're not going to be told. So deal with it. God still has something that he's going to do, apparently announced by these seven thunder, thunderous voices, that no man knows. John knew. He knew what they were, but apparently he ain't telling. So, and I'm telling you, you read commentators, you go online, the seven thunders, and there's no end to trying to, of people trying to explain what the seven thunders said. It's like, what part of you're not supposed to know are you failing to understand? But as Americans, we can't handle that. We just can't handle the idea that God would still have something that he's going to do that he didn't let us in on. It drives us insane. And so people will search and search and search and search and search and search. It's very clear, whatever this is, you're not supposed to know. At some day, we'll know. At that time, we'll all be going, ah, that's what they said. But until that time, it's not. So this, to beat yourself up over this, to be depressed over this, to be just bummed because God is keeping something hidden up his sleeve, is just ridiculous. He's God. He's doing, going to do something that apparently he doesn't want us to know. Well, then why have him thunder with John there? I don't know. Ask him. I wasn't there. I don't know why. I think probably because God wanted to tell us through John, there's things that I know that you don't know. That's why. No, John, don't tell him. Now, again, is this the first time this appears in the scripture? No, it is not. God has done this in the past. So why does everybody beat themselves over Revelation trying to figure this out when it's a clear principle? Back to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 8. Oh boy, could we spend some time here. But in Daniel chapter 8, he's talking about the kingdoms of Pedia, <laughs> Persia and, and, uh, uh, and Greece. And he's talking about the conflict that they had. Now we know this is all historical. This really happened. It happened exactly as Daniel said it would. Well, go figure. That's why the Bible critic says Daniel couldn't have written Daniel because it's too accurate. Daniel, there's no way Daniel could have known these things. You're exactly right. Daniel couldn't have known these things. But Gabriel, who was telling him about him, did. And you can argue all you want. Daniel wrote before all of the, right towards the tail end of all of this stuff. So in this chapter, he's talking about how the Persians were defeated, are going to be defeated by the Grecians. And out of Greece is going to come one leader that's going to come in the near future who is going to be so anti-God that he's going to proclaim himself to be God and would set up an image, okay? And of course, we know that historical figure as Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek. He's the one that did that. He's the one that set up the altar of Zeus with his face on it. Imagine that. Apparently, the dude thought he looked like Zeus. But anyway... Um, and, and you all know that Zeus looks like Liam Neeson, right? Um, so anyway, um, so, but he sets this thing up. And of course, he sets it up in the temple. He slaughters a pig on the altar. He gets rid of the law of God. And he starts killing the Jews. He's a picture of the Antichrist. He was a bad dude. History knows this. One to follow him would be a fellow by the name of Hitler. Little short guy with a funny mustache. See, there's all these figures throughout. And what do they all have in common? The Jews. Imagine that. But anyway, so that's what's all being described here. And Daniel is like, so what, what's going on here? When is this going to happen? And verse 19 of chapter 8 says, and he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time. So it's going to happen in the future, Daniel. But there's a lot of things that were going to happen in the future that were already described. Notice the phrase at the latter time of the indignation. There's a specific point being referenced here. The time of indignation when God says, enough. We call that the tribulation. We're studying it now in the book of Revelation. That's the time that's being described. And in case you didn't get that, for at the appointed time, the end shall be. There's a time this is going to end. 
Remember, we talked about the concept of time in the book of Revelation. Release the four angels at the river. They have been bound for this hour, for this day, for this month, and for this year. There's a time. There's a specific pointed time when all this will come to fruition. But it isn't like Hollywood likes to tell us. Because the whole point of that is so that the Lord can then restore and rebuild what's going on in the earth. He's not just doing these things to snuff us out. He's doing this to purify the earth. Okay? Now, then you get to uh, later on in chapter, uh, chapter 8. Same thing is all going on. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, and here it is, seal up the vision. So there were parts that Daniel saw that he did not relate to us. I wonder if he heard the seven voices. We don't know, but whatever it is, it was to be sealed. He said, well, that's just sealing that until the New Testament times. Well, if that's true, every, we've had this book, Daniel, since like five centuries before Jesus was here. So that can't be right. I mean, it's not been sealed at all. We've been able to study it for millennia. So that's not clearly what it's talking about. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And that, folks, is still many days even for you and I, okay? And then in chapter 12, and 12 is, wow, this incredible chapter. And this is where I believe Michael comes in, because he starts off verse 1. In that day, Michael, your great prince, meaning you, Jewish man, your great prince shall stand. Wow. Now what does Michael do? Ah, wait till we get to chapter 12 of Revelation. I already know because I already talked about it. Okay. But there's other things going on here that Daniel doesn't see. In this chapter, what Daniel sees is Michael standing up. And he sees this and he's prepared for this. And then he sees, and here they are malach, they are angels. And he sees one on this, side, on this bank on one side of the river and one on the other side of the river, right? He sees these. But he also sees a man clothed in white linen above. Notice that in Daniel's vision, he's not on the earth. I believe that's the same one we're talking about in Revelation chapter 10. And when he sees that, he's asking him, What's going on? What's, explain, what's being explained? And notice the response. But you, Daniel, shut up the words. There it is again. So God has things he's going to do that he, we are not privy to. Deal with it. It is frustrating, trust me. I wanted to search this out and I'm thinking, why? It says, I'm not going to know. So seal up the word. And seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. Now that doesn't mean modern transportation or Star Trek transportation with beam me up, Scott. Eh? No. It's talking about the, it's talking about the, the expanse, how, how the, these things are expanding. Okay, And knowledge shall increase. I've used this verse. That's what I think God is doing in our day. I think the knowledge is increasing. I think he's drawing us back to seeing these things as they were intended to be, not as we would like them to be. And many pastors are, are coming to this conclusion as well. And we're scrapping all the stuff. I was telling Marie, and I can't even remember who else I was telling the other day. I'm almost, no joking, I'm almost at a point to where I don't even want to read a commentary anymore. I just don't. I'm tired of everyone's opinion. I'm not interested in anyone's opinion. I'm interested in God's word, period. You shouldn't be interested in my opinion. If you had any brains at all, you take everything I'm saying and go and test it for yourself. So I'm so frustrated with these guys and they're just, they're trying to prove their points and their, their particular theological disciplines and their, their doctrinal understandings. And I just, it just is getting nauseating to me. So I read all of this stuff. I told Marie, these guys are driving me insane. They won't answer. I'm seeing things in the scripture. I'm asking the question, why am I the only one seeing this? Now that doesn't mean to be, I'm saying better. I'm like, how would this, nobody else ever, remember I said two people could look at the same thing? All these guys could look at the, the, the same passage. They all just talk about the angel. Oh, oh yeah, the angel. Well, it's, you know, it's either Jesus or it's one of the angels. 
Really? That's all you have to say? It just drives me insane. So I just said, what? I just set the books aside. I did. And I just said, Lord, that's why I changed my mind when I got in my truck last night. Because I was looking at it from this perspective, but I just, I couldn't let go of this. This is not an angel. This is Jesus. So there you go. Anyway, so Daniel, shut up the words, uh, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And I think that knowledge is going back to God's word and quit worrying about what everybody else thinks. I said before, I'll say it again. I could care less what anybody thinks about the things I said. I just don't. This is what I believe God has shown me. If you've got a problem with that, your problem is with him. Not me. It's just the way it is. I'm just, I'm just to the point where I'm, I'm not worried about it anymore. My job as the pastor of this church, as a shepherd, is to warn you guys, to prepare you guys, to make sure that you're alert to what's happening around you. That's my job. It's my responsibility. It's my duty. And it is what God will hold me accountable to when I stand before him, as I will. So I'm not here to be popular. I'm just not. Though I am very popular. No, just kidding. <laughs> I, it doesn't matter to me. It just doesn't. I've had it. I've had it. What does his word say? And it's great to hear from this side and hear from that side. Great, great. I'm, and I'm glad you guys have, you know, given your opinions and your interpretations, but I'm only interested in what God has to say. So the stuff you're seeing that I'm sharing with you, you're not going to find in another book. It's just not. Because it's, it's a completely different perspective. It just is. I, because I'm, well... I'm different. I know that surprises you. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I'm out about just doing whatever I'm doing and, and people will go, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. And they're like, you don't look like a pastor, man. Yeah, I know. I get that all the time. I don't. I had one guy tell me, he said, dude, you look like a truck driver, not a pastor. <laughs> Apparently it's, it's, it's that, it's this muscle I've been working on all these years. Six pack. Who needs a six pack? I got a keg. <laughs> anyway. Verse five. Now the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land. So we know who we're talking about here. Notice what he does. Raised up his hand to heaven. Now think of the picture. On the sea. Authority on the sea. Authority on the land, authority being taken back of the earth, and he connects it to heaven by raising his hand. How stinking cool is that? That's the picture being described here with the book of judgment in the other hand. It's probably this way, right hand raised, right? I mean, I, in my mind, I'm just going, whoa. I almost want to get a t shirt with that on it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but that. That is just stunning to me. And here's another point now where they say this couldn't be Jesus. Because as he has his hand in heaven and he swore, swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea, where are his feet? Oh, just saying. Um, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. That can't be Jesus. He's swearing by the throne. Jesus doesn't have to swear by anyone. Really. Then how come the book of Hebrews says to us that because God couldn't swear by anyone greater, he swore by himself. He's making the oath and verifying the oath. I have made an oath that I will give the land to Abraham, God said. So where does that come from? Well, this can't be Jesus because he swore. Really? I read in the scripture all over the place that, that the Lord swears by himself. And it isn't that he's swearing to himself. He's swearing by himself. See, that's the confusion. He's saying, my character is such that I am making this promise to you. And you can take it to the bank. You don't have to worry about it. Because I am he. I am who I am. I am Yahweh. I am those things. It just goes, I mean, this is so amazing. So he swears by him who created the heaven and things. Well, I thought that was him. Well, it is him. Again, 
If you got a lion and a lamb and they're standing apart and all of a sudden it looks like they're one and you've got Jesus standing in the midst of the throne, but he's not in the middle of the throne. He's actually in the midst of the throne. He is the throne. The throne is him. So what's the problem with seeing him swear by heaven and earth? And he's, but he's clearly been given authority, his feet, his legs, on, over all of creation. This is what he's doing. He's taking back authority, right? Daniel 12, back to Daniel 12. And here's the one clothed in linen that's above the waters, which I believe is the same one we just read about. And one said to the man, one of the ones, one of the angels, clearly Malach, standing on the, on the two sides of the river, and one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven. Oh. Oh. Notice there's both hands being held up now in Daniel's vision. The reason? Because the time had not come for the book of judgment to be opened yet. Those days had not arrived. So both hands are raised. But notice again, this is who it is that he's raising his hand. It was above the water. When he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever. Jeez, where have we heard this before? It's just crazy to me to not connect the dots. But if you're not wanting to see this, a Jewish Jesus speaking to a Jewish John, then why would you talk about a Jewish Daniel? You're not interested in that. You're more interested in, in the Western perspective of how things, and we've, 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 we're so far off. It's just, it's stunning. Absolutely stunning. We would not like that if anybody did that to us. In fact, we would hate it. But it's okay for us to do it to others. He swore by him who lives forever. Now watch this. That it shall be. Now who's saying this? The Lord, the man clothed in lin white linen over the river. He said it for a time, times, and a half a time. And remember we said this vision in chapter 10 is the first part of that interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. This is the first part. Guess what the second part is? We already said part of it is the measuring of the trump of, of the, I'm sorry, of the temple right? Then there's the two witnesses that come involved. And then it's the first time that we see the reference to times, time, time, times, and half a time. Now, if you don't know what's being described there, a time is a year, times is two years, and a half a time is a half a year, three and a half years. The duration of the great tribulation. Guess when that starts in Revelation? Once the foot is on the land, and once the foot is on the sea and the hand reaches to heaven, it's the first occurrence of times, times, and half a time in the book of, Je uh, book of Revelation. So you think something might be going on here? Chapter 10 is where I believe, based on all of this stuff, and I don't care what anybody else says, this is now beginning the period that Jesus described as then there shall be great tribulation such as the world has never seen nor will ever see again. Nothing in, on earth to that point can possibly compare to it. That's how bad it is. It's rough. For a time, times. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Guess what else happens in chapter 11 and chapter 12? The holy people are scattered because the dragon is going after them because he's been whooped by Michael. Chapter eight, verse 8 now of chapter 10. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel or the messenger who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. Now, here was my problem. This is why I went. I'll tell you for me why initially I was going with Michael. Because I didn't like John's attitude. <laughs> I got to tell you. If this is the Lord Jesus, I'm thinking, John, somebody should have smacked you for going up and saying, give me the book. And then I stopped to think about this and I'm thinking, wait a second. What did you just do? You did the same thing that other people do. This is the problem with email, with texting, with all the other stuff. You can read words, but you cannot see emotion. 
And you need to be cautious when somebody says something, that they send something to you electronically, that you don't misread it. Don't be a dork and read it with, you know, hostility or anger. Take the time to sit back and say, well, now wait a second. What if I read this like this? Because it'll give you a whole different perspective. So initially, I'm thinking, how dare John, anyone for that matter, Michael, Gabriel, I don't care who you are. How dare you go to the Lord of glory, the creator of all things, who has just shown he's taken back and said, give me the book. Because he didn't say, give me the book. I'm sure he went, give me the book. <laughs> now, you can't fault the guy. He was just told to do that. He's obedient to what he's just been asked to do. And interestingly enough, the concept, the word give here can mean, give me it. In other words, I want to take possession of it. But it can also mean to receive something in, in, in the sense of being grateful. So it isn't just give. But that was my hang up, I'm telling you. In fact, when I went home last night, I told Marie I had some more reading to do. That's where I went. Because I was just irritated with John. <laughs> I was, I'm telling you. I was like, when I get there, I'm going to have to set John down and say, now listen, dude, that was really disrespectful. I think John's going to say, no, no, wait a minute, man. That's not really what happened. That's not how it went down. You weren't there. I was there. Well, and I know what your English says, but what I really said was, may I have the book, please? And I was just doing what I was asked. So anyway, so John's got a break now. He doesn't have to worry about Rick showing up and questioning him. Anyway, so he, he goes and he says, can I have the book? And he, said, and he said, take it and eat it. Now that is really strange to you and I, unless you understand the word of God. I mean, I, no matter how I love the Bible, I'm not eating this book, okay? <laughs> not gonna happen. But what the understanding here is, the concept is taking God's word within to where it becomes a part of you. It nourishes you. That's the idea. So it isn't eat because that's again what our American thing is which my belly is now saying, wrap this up because we need to eat. <laughs> so that's not the concept. The concept is take this into yourself. Now notice, take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter. Now this again is nothing new. This is what happened in the Old Testament. And it will make your stomach bitter. Once you eat it, it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. It will be very pleasant. And you see, this I would agree with some of these guys. I agree. The word of God is absolutely sweet to those who love him and are in a relationship with him. But we know, if we understand that, that it's not going to turn out so well for those that don't. And it makes us nauseous, or at least it should make us nauseous, to think that all this wrath is going to come on mankind. It's, it's if that doesn't shock you, then something is wrong with you. I'm telling you. We got to get this mentality out that, well, they deserve what they get. And it's okay because I'm okay. So it really doesn't matter to me what happened. That's the world's perspective. God weeps over the condition of this world and their hatred of him when he has done nothing but express his love. Right there. The clearest definition of love mankind has ever seen or ever will see again. And mankind has shunned it. And it breaks our hearts that these people have to go through this. So it is definitely sweet. But it's also upsetting to think that people will not respond to this. And the, and the tragedy that they're bringing upon themselves. Verse 10. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand. I ate it. And it was sweet in my honey. Imagine that. In other words, he's saying it was exactly as he said. But when I had eaten, it became sweet. And he said to me, you must prophesy again. Now prophecy, remember, is not foretelling the future. Stop with the foretelling the future garbage that all of us want to think. Oh, he's a prophet. He speaks about the future. He's prophesying. He's speaking of the future. The word prophet, prof prophecy or prophet, prophetes, means to proclaim the truth. If that truth has to do with something in the future, then so be it. But it's not the purpose of the proclamation. Prophesying is to proclaim the truth. Simply that. If it pertains to the future, well then it does. 
But if it doesn't, it's still the truth proclaimed. And he said to me, you must proclaim the truth again. Now I believe that we know that John still, after this experience, he lived for many years and he lived in Ephesus and brought up a young fella whose name was, uh, oh my gosh, I just drove a blank. Uh, starts with a P. Oh my gosh. Polyon. Polycarp. There we go. I knew that didn't sound right. Polycarp. Now there's a name for you, huh? Polycarp. Dude, smells like a fish. Anyway, uh, <laughs> just kidding. But John would raise him up. And John's ministry at the church at Ephesus, by which young Timothy would come from and come out, would, would be a huge part of that. Obviously, Paul's ministry there was huge. And so, so, so he would proclaim again. But even more than that, remember at this time, he was writing these things down, but he hadn't put them out yet. I believe that also as the proclamation of the truth as we have it in the book of Revelation. And I think that the, very, the reason that we're studying it today is proof that what, hap, what John is told here is exactly right. You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. The book of Revelation is nothing but that, as well as his gospel. The one last verse, Matthew chapter 28. We call it the Great Commission. The Great Commission. This is where Jesus sent out the apostles. And this doesn't mean it concluded with them. It means it was supposed to continue. This is why we as a church, Calvary Chapel Mesquite, continue to send people out. And we will continue to send people out. If we have to sell this building to do it, like I said, not interested in opinions, we will do what the Lord has asked us to do. But I think it's because we're doing that that we have this building. So we're not stopping. Amen? We're out there doing this. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This is after his resurrection. Now watch this. If this does not sound to you like Revelation chapter 10, all authority has been given. Ah, he swore by the one. See, that authority was given to Jesus. He recognized that. Why do we have such a hard time with it? All authority has been given to me where? In heaven and on the earth. Revelation chapter 10. Because of that, go. Go therefore and make disciples, not believers. Okay? We make disciples. We proclaim the gospel through evangelism. And when the gospel is proclaimed, we take the time to train them, which is discipleship. We are making disciples. That's our call. Some within this fellowship are called to evangelize. We're all called to evangelize. But some specifically. But we're all called to discipleship. Why does the church have all of these studies on, for men, women, children, blah, 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 Sunday nights, or, or I'm sorry, Wednesday nights? Because we're making disciples. That's the point. That's the purpose. We're not doing it because we want to, though I do like it. We're doing it because that's what we're told to do. How do people learn of the Lord? By coming to these classes. We're making disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Notice that. Not just the Jews. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice, after they're made disciples, then you hold them under the water. Okay? You don't want to hold somebody under the water in case the bubbles stop for too long if they're not already disciples. No, I'm just kidding. So, you baptizing them. And then doing what? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's why we do this as a church. Communicating to you the things that Jesus has taught me. Simple as that. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Let it be. How cool is that? Genesis chapter 10, it ain't about no angel. He's going to show up in a couple chapters. Actually, one chapter. We're going to see him. This ain't an angel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean to you and I today? He does, has not, this has not happened. This kingdom, the kingdom of this world, still belongs to the enemy, the adversary. 
Again, a cursory look at the news will tell you that. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out things are not going like they should. People do horrible things to other people. So clearly he's not in control. But there's coming the day when he will take back control again. And that day is when he stands with one foot on the sea, one foot on the, on the land, over the temple, and he raises his hand to heaven, and he says, here, these are going to conclude everything, because there's not going to be any more delay. So that means, folks, we have some thinking to do, because there's a point at which our king, which we claim to follow, is actually going to come back and establish himself as king. And it's easy to say, well, we're servants of the king and, you know, flake out on our service because the king ain't here. So you can get away with it. It's like the little kid, right? Taking the cookies in the bedroom. We think we get away with it. And we are for now, but not for long. This should change everything about the way we approach life and what awaits for us in the future. Our king is coming back. And what anybody thinks about that is absolutely irrelevant. And I, as well as you, should care less. Period. He's going to come back. Doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. He's coming back. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. But we've got work to do in the meantime. Let's stand. We're closing the word of prayer. And then I'm going to need help from one of you guys to help me shut this stupid thing off again because I still don't know how to turn this thing off. <laughs> Does that surprise you? <laughs> I had to get Brandon to go over. My printer wasn't printing and I couldn't figure it out. He did everything I could. I was about ready to throw that stinking thing out in the driveway. And I thought, you know what? I'll go get Brandon or somebody. So Brandon went down and within five minutes he had the thing working. These guys are miracle workers. <laughs> Gifts from heaven above. So they're trying to show me how to turn this thing off. Why can't you just push a button to turn it off? Why does it have to have all this other stuff? I don't get it. Anyways, maybe I'll just unplug it. That's probably the best. No, don't do that. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, we know we live in a world where you are not in control because we're a people that don't want you to be in control. I mean, mankind as a whole. But regardless, Lord, you will come back and establish your kingdom. And if it's true, Lord, that you're a king and we are servants of the king, then maybe we should start living like it. Maybe we should start acting as if we had a part and a role in what is to be and quit worrying about ourselves and start thinking about others and how we might be of, of assistance to you and to others, Lord, in building your kingdom. So, Lord, just help us to take these things that we've learned to make the changes in our lives that are necessary to make us the people that you want us to be. Thanks for meeting with us this morning, Lord. We really appreciate it. And we're, we're, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for worship. We're grateful for prayer. We're grateful for fellowship and all of the wonderful things that Sunday mornings and pretty much every other time we meet are all about. We just love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you guys.